Next up, as we just mentioned, this is not your run-of-the-mill New Hampshire primary. Ex-President Donald Trump has seemed for months to be headed for a victory on the Republican side despite his re-election loss in 2020. And on the other side of the aisle, incumbent President Joe Biden opted out of the New Hampshire race altogether over a dispute with Granite State Democrats over whether the first in the nation primary should be held there or somewhere else. But will a late surge from Nikki Haley cast doubt on Trump's inevitability? And will a campaign pushing Democrats to write Biden's name in on the ballot save him from an embarrassingly weak finish? To break it all down, I'm joined by Andrew Smith, director of the University of New Hampshire Survey Center and Boston Globe political reporter Emma Platoff. Thank you both for being here. I know you're extremely busy. Emma, let me start with you. When people think of the New Hampshire primary, they think of a a scene, or at least I do, where you've got three to five interested citizens sitting in a diner asking question after question of a presidential candidate who takes you know, all their inquiries and responds thoughtfully and takes all the time that they could possibly want to fill them in on where he or she stands. But you've reported that that's not really the way it is working in this election cycle. What changed? The big difference is you have a front runner in Donald Trump who seems not very interested in embracing that sort of political lore of the New Hampshire primary. You know, he's not in diners. He's not doing town halls. He's not taking questions directly from voters. He's not really shaking hands or kissing babies. He's holding these large rallies, drawing bigger crowds than the other candidates and, and certainly reaching a very devoted group of supporters, but not engaging in that sort of one on one way that has become the story of the New Hampshire primary. So did the other candidates follow his lead and shift away from that sort of thing, or did they do it as he went instead to bigger, more spectacular events? I think the answer is yes and no. Overall, there were fewer retail politics events just over this cycle. That said, Nikki Haley, you know, in the final stretch here as she tries to close the gap with Donald Trump, has been ramping up her schedule, doing a lot of sort of small scale meet and greets today. One has to wonder if part of that might be the influence of Governor Chris Sununu here, who's sort of a master of the um, New Hampshire retail political scene. But for months, really, we did not see the number of diner stops and fish fries that you might typically expect in a cycle. Andrew Smith, you did a poll just over a week ago saying that Haley is in striking distance or was at the time of Donald Trump and that she might benefit and get even closer if Chris Christie dropped out of the race, as he has. What's your sense of how close she is to Donald Trump right now? Well, it would have been a whole lot better for Nikki Haley had uh, Vivek Ramaswamy stayed in after Iowa because Yes, she got a lot of support from uh, Christie voters who want anybody other than Donald Trump. But the problem is that both for Ramaswamy and for uh, Ron DeSantis voters, their second choice is Donald Trump. Uh, so when Ramaswamy dropped out, any advantage that she got from Christie dropping out has really been equaled by Trump. Uh, and so I don't think she's closed the gap. I think it'll be very difficult for her to close the gap, in part because Trump is beating her by almost two to one among registered Republicans. And no candidate has won the New Hampshire primary without winning the plurality of their party's registered voters. Uh, we have a myth about the independent voters here, but the independent voters have never determined who wins the New Hampshire primary. Is it possible that this cycle could be the exception? Because as I understand it from your polling in large part, Haley is attracting massive support from independents who are planning to vote in the Republican primary this year, right? It's mathematically possible, but she would have to win upwards of 75 percent of the undeclared votes in order to overcome Trump's uh, lead among registered Republicans. A very hard task. And she's relying a lot on, on uh, uh, people who are really Democrats. They may be registered and declared what we unfortunately call independents, but they're really Democrats. It's hard enough to get people to come out and vote in their own party's primary, let alone go out and vote in the opposite party's primary. It'd be like asking a Red Sox fan to go down to, the, uh, to Yankee Stadium and cheer for the Yankees because they want them to beat the other team that they're playing so they can get to the playoffs. It's possible. It just doesn't happen very often. So Haley's got a much more difficult task uh, ahead of her, also in part because 
the undeclared or independent voters don't turn out at the same rates as do registered voters. Um, so if you had to bet on somebody, you'd want to bet on your registered voters rather than on the undeclareds or independents. I would think that her challenge there is made tougher by the fact that at least some of the messaging that she's been engaging in over the last couple of weeks might not be particularly appealing to left-leaning independents. I want to just play a quick bite of her on Fox News back on Tuesday in which she said, and this got a lot of attention, that we are not a racist country in the United States. Let's take a look. We're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. But our goal is to always make sure we try and be more mm -hmm. perfect every day that we can. Emma Platoff, I'm wondering, are there other aspects of this particular unusual primary that have stood out to you as you've been reporting up there? For example, the enthusiasm or lack of enthusiasm around this push to get people to write in Joe Biden so he doesn't have an embarrassingly weak finish. Or perhaps the way that Haley is making her pitch to those same unenrolled voters that we've been talking about. Anything stand out that you've seen that you want to highlight? Those are both really interesting points. I mean, the big story, the big story Tuesday, right, will be the results of the primary. And the big story Wednesday will be what that means for the general election. We've been talking for months with voters and in our newsroom about the enthusiasm gap here. You know, it's it's hard to get voters out to, to write in a name. It's really it's just a taller ask than, than pushing a button that's already on the ballot. And we know just from, from polls and from dozens of conversations I've had with voters that so few people in this country are excited about the prospect of a Trump-Biden rematch this fall. So the implications of that, I think, will be clear from Tuesday's results, and we'll have more to say after that. I want to bring up, since we're talking about that writing campaign, Andrew, you pulled on that recently, too, in your January 9th poll. Democrats, 69 percent, said that they were planning to back Joe Biden. Seven percent said they were planning to back Dean Phillips. And six percent said they were looking at Marianne Williamson. Uh, it sounds to me like there's a little tension between the lack of enthusiasm that Emma is describing among uh, people for uh, Biden, writing in Biden, um, and that finding of yours. But maybe I'm not thinking about it the right way. Were you surprised that 69 percent of people were planning to support Biden, even though he tried to undercut the primary itself? Not really, because I think that uh, national party politics will trump anything that goes on with the primary among voters when it comes to November. Uh, yeah, Democrats aren't really happy about um, the, the DNC and Biden uh, bypassing New Hampshire as the first primary. Uh, but... Uh, they also recognize that they don't want Donald Trump as a president, and they don't see another Democrat that they can do better than Biden. When we ask in polls, do they want Biden as a president? Likely Democratic primary voters wish they had somebody else, but they don't know who that person is. So they're basically trudging to the polls to put Biden's name there so as not to have Biden embarrassed and be a further weakened candidate going into November. Um, I think that the... Uh, the, the campaign has been very nervous about this. The, the writing campaign isn't a new thing. It was really being planned as far back as last spring. And there's been quite a bit of effort putting into it because there are a lot of people that frankly worked on that are working on the Biden campaign or have worked for Biden recently that were going clean for Gene in 1968. And they remembered the last time that we had a write-in campaign in New Hampshire with the sitting president, and that was with LBJ in 68. And his narrow win over Gene McCarthy um, led him to drop out of the race. Democrats really don't want to see that happen. They don't have an alternative to, to, to Biden, even though they don't really like him necessarily uh, being at the top of the ticket. It is remarkable to think that there are people who are working on the ground who actually have a memory of, of the Gene McCarthy situation. That's really kind of mind-boggling. Andrew Smith, Emma Platoff, thank you for being here to talk this stuff through and enjoy the next uh, few days up there. Thank you very much. Thank you.